It's time for your daily LSU baseball update with Musso at the box. Now, Matt Musso. And welcome into another edition of Musso at the Box. It is game week for the defending national champions. LSU opens the 2024 season this Friday, February the 16th versus VMI. It's going to be a great week here on Musso at the Box. Fired up for it. Uh, today, we will recap the final scrimmage weekend. Uh, tomorrow, uh, we will have our, you know, we'll go through the schedule, talk about that a little bit, and kind of give predictions for LSU record-wise, look at the tough stretches they have. Uh, we'll also kind of wedge in some of all the uh, preseason honors that they've received as well because we haven't really touched on those yet. So we'll, we'll kind of you know lump those in with the schedule. And then come Wednesday and Thursday's show, that's when we'll give our final thoughts, our final preview on the pitching staff uh, on one day. The other day will be the final preview on the offense. We'll give, you know... Thoughts on roles, projected lineups, all of that on that day. And then Friday, it's game day, and we're previewing the competition finally. So it's going to be a great week here on Moose at the Box, and I'm fired up for it. Of course, right off the top, remind you, get subscribed up to the YouTube channel, Muso at the Box. That's our new feature this year. Hit the bell when you get subscribed, and you will uh, be notified every time a new video posts. And, of course, uh, when you're looking – excuse me – when you're looking at – um. Just the audio portion of it as well. Apple, Spotify, Google, wherever you get your podcast audio-wise, we're there. Get subscribed up uh, as, as well. There You can follow me on Twitter at Musso Matthew. All right, so like I said, today is going to be – get my notes pulled back up here. Today is going to be the final uh, weekend of scrimmages recaps. There is so much that I want to get to from Sunday's scrimmage because – it was jammed packed with a lot of different things. Guys in new positions. They moved people around a lot. You had a really awesome standout relief performance from one guy in particular that I want to talk about. But it was a big offensive day as well. So we got to dive into that because there's uh, one guy offensively who happens to be a transfer, who had himself a whale of a weekend. That's Mac Bingham. So we're going to talk about him as he is probably LSU's hottest hitter going into the start of the regular season. And that could be huge for this lineup as they start to piece it, piece it together, uh, as we expect them to kind of have to do early in the season until they can find that right combination. So again, a lot to get to from Sunday's scrimmage. But do want to pass along a few things uh, that made headlines out of Friday and uh, and Saturday. So let's start with Friday. The thing that made headlines there was the starting pitching. Uh, on one hand, for a great reason. On the other hand, for a not so great reason. Well, what do you want first? You know, the bad news or, or the good news? And I say that kind of in, you know, I mean, mainly in jest, tongue in cheek. It's, it's a preseason scrimmage. There really is no... Uh, bad news nothing that actually happens out there has any impact on the regular season as of right now you leave it and, and move on but you, you get what i mean just it's the, the two outcomes were so drastic but so that that's why i kind of go ah good news or bad news so anyway i digress um let's start i guess with the quote unquote bad that would have been thatcher heard on friday it was just a really rough outing for him uh ended up being three and a third six earned runs he was lifted after three and a third with the bases loaded. Gavin Gidry came in to relieve him, and all three runs scored. So they were all charged back to Thatcher Hurd. Is that what you want to see? No, of course not. But I think we also all understand that you don't have your best stuff every single day, and bad days are going to happen in baseball. That's really the one bad day that Thatcher has Thatcher had has hurt. Thatcher Hurd has had say that five times fast throughout the course of the fall practice period and now the preseason practice period. He's been very good. So I, I'm willing to put that aside as a one-off, especially considering how he finished last year. The stuff just wasn't crisp. I mean, that, that's that's going to happen. I'd rather that happen now in a, in a scrimmage setting than you know potentially in the season. And again, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that that's not going to happen to him in the season. It very well could happen to him in the season because – it's the game of baseball, and it's it's screwy. But that is one side of the coin from a starting pitching standpoint is Thatcher Hurd, who I think many look upon right now as the guy who's probably going to start game number one for LSU. He had a, a little bit of a rough outing, but 
you you flush it, you move on. The regular season starts next week. He'll be in the rotation at some spot, whether it's Friday, Saturday, or even Sunday. At some part of that rotation, he will slot in, and he will put that behind him and go out there and give you a great effort. Um, on the other side of the coin, where it was incredible from a starting pitching standpoint, was Luke Holman. Luke Holman Friday threw five shutout innings with five strikeouts and was insanely efficient in those. The efficiency is ultimately what stood out more than anything from Holman. He carved through the lineup that he faced. And I'll remind you, remember, what LSU does with this, they balance those lineups pretty evenly. There's not, um, you know, it's not, quote-unquote, first string on one side, second string on the other side. They, you know, Jared Jones will be in one lineup. Tommy White will be in the other. Uh, Hayden Dravinsky will be in one lineup. Paxton Kling will be in the other. Like, it's it's balanced throughout. So, to watch him be able to go through and carve up the guys uh, the way he did. Again, like I said, five shutout with five strikeouts. That is uh, that is dominant stuff and, and very, very encouraging. The other standout performance on the mound uh, from... Friday, and I think this is noteworthy, is, hold on, I have to pull it up. Um, give me one second here. We are almost there. It was Nate Ackenhausen. Two and a third, shut out out of the bullpen, only gave up two hits. Uh, that's great to see. Obviously, a guy who can fill many different roles for LSU. We've talked plenty about Nate. You know that, whether it's hell, spot start potentially for him. Uh like it was in Omaha or just out of the bullpen, middle relief, longer relief, uh, or shutting down a ball game. So that, that was noteworthy. Uh, looking at, at Saturday, one pitching performance in particular, I mean, Cam Johnson threw two shutout innings. That's fantastic to see, but I think everyone just kind of come to expect that of him. That was Saturday. The, the other standout performance that I think is very noteworthy from the weekend from a relieving standpoint, happened Saturday, and it was Sam Dutton. And Sam Dutton threw two shutout innings on Saturday, only giving up one hit and three strikeouts. That's massive because that's a guy who's now into his third year who has pitched an awful lot at LSU. And when you go back and you look at Sam Dutton's year last season in 2023, the numbers aren't going to jump off the page at you from like an ERA standpoint or especially a batting average against standpoint. But what he does is he throws strikes. He is... An elite strike thrower is Sam Dutton. I mean, just look at, well, go to last year. Last year, he walked seven in 20 innings and struck out 21. He was one of the only guys, let's see, he, I'm sorry, you know, he was the only guy on LSU's team last season that had at least 20 innings pitched and single-digit walks. He throws strikes. The problem is they got hit too much last year. The opponent hit 391 off of Sam Dutton last season. The stuff is very good. We know that. So to see him go out there and throw two shutout with three strikeouts, only giving up the one hit, that's encouraging for me going forward. I'll admit Dutton maybe hasn't made many headlines coming out of this preseason, but to have that as your last outing going into um, into the regular season, I think is encouraging. And when they're looking for right-handed relievers, because you have so many lefties that you trust, but when you're looking for potentially that next right-handed option, Sam Dutton is somebody who could absolutely emerge in that. Again, third year in the program, pounds the strike zone, which is what you always want coming out of the bullpen. You can't have somebody come in and, and walk guys. That's how you get into big trouble late in games. So saw that, uh, and it caught my eye because that that could be a very big piece if it's something that he can build off of and, and go into the regular season as as a very reliable option for LSU in the, in the bullpen. All right, now let's get into into um into Sunday scrimmage because I was out there, took in the entire thing. They played about six innings. Um, I say that because it ended technically kind of on a on a walk off, and they just called it after that. Um, and we'll get into that situation because it's again, it's not anything to you know, go jump off a building over, but it is a, it is a, a scenario that we've talked about happening at the back end of the games. So the pitching staff was put into motion and it, it didn't hit. So it's just something that, and again, it's not going to every time, but it's just something that I didn't notice. That's the cool thing about it. We come here and we talk about these scrimmages all the time. Right. And it's like, okay, well, they, 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 they don't always play it straight up. You know, they'll start a runner here to start an inning. You have a runner first with nobody out, right? Without even, he's just placed there. Or, or you know, they, they immediately ask someone to try to bunt. They, 
they don't always play it straight up. Today, and really for this weekend, for the most part, they did. It was kind of a dress rehearsal. They had the walk-up music going. They had, uh, you know, they, I mean, they treated it like a game. Gave out the starting lineup and, you know, where everybody's playing in the field. It, it was straight up. And they managed it that way um, for the most part as well. So that was obviously interesting to see. Same starting pitchers that you've had really all all preseason on these Sunday games. Kate Anderson for one side. Javen Coleman for the other I mentioned off the top, it was a massive offensive day at the box on Sunday, and it was. And it was a big offensive day on a on a day weather-wise where the conditions really weren't conducive to offense. There was kind of a swirling wind. It would change direction very rapidly. At one hitter, it would be blowing in. The very next guy, it's blowing out. Things of that nature. So just tough to play outfield, obviously, in something like that. And I thought LSU did very, very well there. Um but also tough to get the ball out of the yard. And they did it four times. They hit four home runs uh, on, on Sunday. So that was something that definitely stood out uh, big there. Um, let's get into some of the individual performances. And we are going to start offensively. And we're going to start with Mac Bingham. Because, goodness, um, I'm getting really, really excited about Mac Bingham the more I watch him. I know when we talked, we had our transfer show last week, uh, and we, we talked about him obviously as, as one of them, and that you know he's a he may not he might not be this great toolsy player, but he just does everything well. It might not be to this elite level, but he does everything well. He's a veteran guy that has. Four years of college baseball under his belt. He's coming off career highs in multiple offensive categories as a senior at Arizona and now is at, at LSU reunited with his uh, former head coach and is going to have a starting spot in the outfield. But the more I watch him, the more excited I get about him. And one reason is the pop in the bat. He had another home run on Sunday, had one on Saturday as well. And look, the, the 10 homers were by far a career high for him. And I don't think it was a one-off. There is some pop in that bat. They always say power is the last thing to develop for a hitter. It's mainly pull side. You know, he's not going to jump the yard on Yapo very often. But that guy having pop in his bat, a, a, a metal bat to the pull side, yeah. I mean, I think I think it's very reasonable to, um, to think he can get to double-digit home runs again for LSU this year. And that's going to be a great help to this lineup. Also, having a veteran hitter like that this hot heading into the regular season is going to be a big boost to this lineup whenever they're trying to find that right combination. So, Mac Bingham was awesome all weekend. He had six hits over the course of the three scrimmages. With uh, There was a double in there. There was also the, the home runs. The one on Sunday was a three-run shot. It came off of Javen Coleman. Um, and it, it got it ended up with... It happened, I should say, after a quick two outs. Coleman got a strikeout and then a fly out. Uh, it was a great diving catch, actually, in the outfield. Forgive me, I don't remember who it was, and I did not mark it down. That is my part. That is my fault. Uh, but then Coleman hit a batter. He and that was I can tell you who it was. He hit Milam. He walked Malazzo. That flipped the lineup, and that's when Mac Bingham uh, hit hit the three run home run. So you know just. Him coming up in big spots and, and coming through. He's He has been fantastic uh, really since getting to LSU, but especially this weekend. He he was, Mac Bingham was awesome and is really emerging as what's going to be a threat and a multidimensional threat in this lineup for LSU. Because I'm, I'm telling you, the, the pop, there's pop in that bat. That, that guy, I, I'm, I'm getting to the point now where I'm going to be surprised if Mac Bingham does not hit double-digit home runs uh, this season for LSU. I think he has a chance to rack up some early in the pre-conference slate, and I, I think he'll run some out in the SEC too. I, 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 like, I like Mac Bingham an awful, awful lot. I'm, I'm sure you can tell. Um, the other guy I want to talk about and, and hone in on uh, offensively is Hayden Travinsky because tr he, looks, he looks so good. He looks like he did when he was inserted into the lineup late last season and went on that tear. That's what he looks like. And again, it's it's a multidimensional ways. He's not just running the ball out of the yard. He he has such a great understanding of the game right now at the plate in the situation. And I'll give you an example of when that really sh showed. 
Because, again, a guy like Travansky who can leave the yard on, on any swing of the bat, sometimes you fall into that and you try to do too much. He's not doing that right now. And that's going to be huge for LSU having him in the lineup. So if you go to the third inning, the top of the third inning, uh, Kate Anderson's on the mound, and he gives up the solo home run to Zeb Ruddle to lead off that inning. Jake Brown follows with a double, which almost left the yard, by the way. It hit right below that yellow line on the fence, and it, it's a double. So they almost went back-to-back, but Brown hits the double. Brady Neal comes up, sack fly to center field. Oh, I'm sorry, sack fly to right field. Excuse me. Um, so you've moved the runner. You have a home run. Then you've moved the runner over to third, one out, and Hayden Travinsky's coming to the plate. And he doesn't try to do too much. He hits a ground ball to the right side, scores the run. It's textbook baseball. It's just what you want to see. But when you have a, a elite power hitter up like that, you have to get the run home any way possible. That's ultimately what you want, runner at third. Power hitter or not, runner at third and less than two outs, you have to get that run home any way possible. Ground ball to the right side, base hit, sack fly, doesn't matter. You have to get that run in. And Hayden Travinsky in that moment doesn't try to do too much and hits the ground ball to the right side and gets the RBI ground out. That is... That is that is maturity, is what that is. It was a very very mature at bat, and it you know it was after he had a double in the ball game already. So again, I mean he was he was awesome. But that spot, and I'll tell you what else it did too, is it shows that this team can absolutely be as dangerous and as as um versatile offensively as last year's club. That's an inning you would have seen from LSU last year time and time again. Big fly, manufacture the run. How many times did we talk about it last year throughout the season? How many times have we already talked about it this year and referencing them like we're doing right now? Multiple times. And that is another reason that was so, so encouraging. And again, it can factor into, you look at Hayden Travinsky as the guy who's going to get the first chance to protect Tommy White. It doesn't have to be because he's hitting 20 home runs. What ultimately gives that protection and why they're going to have to face Tommy White is because the guy behind him, you know, in this case, we're hypothetically saying Hayden Travinsky's going to get the run home any way possible. So that gives me even more confidence in him sliding into that spot because of the maturity of the at-bats right now from him. I thought I, I loved it. I mean, it was that was... That was massive from Travinsky in in that spot and and showed a lot. So, uh, love that. We've been keeping an eye on Jared Jones to see how he did. Um, happy to re- happy to report Jared Jones went one for three today with a double. He did not, uh, or excuse me, uh, Sunday one for three Sunday with a double did not punch out in the ball game. The double also came on a three two breaking ball. Uh, so that was that was great. It was up. I mean, the pitch was left up, but he. He recognized it. I mean, he he saw it out of the hand and didn't miss it and laced the double. That is progress. It needs to happen more often, obviously, but that is something we have really honed in on here in the preseason. And to see him come through in that spot, I I was very I was very pleased um, there. All right, I'm trying to think if there's anything else I had noted for offense that I wanted to get to. Um, you know, like I said, the four homers that that was great. Stephen Milam left the yard, and I mean, it was a he crushed the ball. Low line drive into the left field bleachers would have got out on any day. It didn't matter wind blowing in or not, cold or not. I mean, he just crushed the ball. Uh, that was the same thing with Ashton Larson's home run. Low liner right over the right field wall. I mean, th- those two get out any day of the week. Like I said, it wasn't necessarily a conducive offensive day on Sunday. And, and they both, I mean, they crushed the baseball. I think really all of them. All four of them get out on, on any day. So that that was great to see. They're going to they're gonna have some pop in this lineup, y'all. I know we talked about that uh, last week during the Q&A, and, and somebody had asked, you know, are you going to see more, you know, man, small ball stolen bases, bunts, or anything like that? And I said, I, you might see a little bit more of it, but they've got guys who are going to, like, they're going to hit over 100 home runs again. And today, clarify that because you saw it from multiple different guys. I mean, you saw it from a guy like Bingham, who you think is going to be a starter, obviously. But Zeb Ruddle? Steven Milam, Ashton Larson, we're not expecting them to go start game one, and they're leaving the yard, so you have it throughout. And again, I'm not going to tell you that Steven Milam's going to be a guy who's ever going to hit double-digit home runs in his LSU career, but he can run into one every now and then. Uh, that's that's massive. So they're, they're going to have plenty of pop in this lineup once again. 
Um, all right, let's let's get to some of the pitching from Sunday while while we have a chance because I got to see a lot of different guys um, and got to see an end of game situation that we've talked about an awful lot play out and it uh, it didn't work actually. We're gonna get to that. I want to highlight Cade Woods. So on a day where one, two, three, four, five guys through, five guys through. Cade Woods was the only one to not give up a run. And it was dominant. Sat here a week ago, last Monday, recapping scrimmages. It talked about Cade Woods and how in, in that game, he was effectively wild. He threw two shutout innings, but he got himself into a lot of trouble. In one of those innings, he loaded the bases with free passes. He got out of it, but he loaded the bases with free passes. You can't do that. It's not a way to make a living. So I wanted to be like, okay, the next time I see him, let's see how he does. He was dominant. Absolutely dominant. So comes in in relief of um, Kate Anderson, excuse me, and first battery faces is Mick Paul. Bases are empty. Paul hits a ball to first base. Uh, Jones can't handle it. It took a really tough hop on him at the end. Kind of, uh, he was trying to get down on it. It hopped up and caromed off his shoulder. So Paul reaches on an error. That's the way Cade Woods' outing starts. Guy reaching on an error. He should have had two, uh, you know, the second out of the inning at that point. And instead, there's a base runner. It can spiral on you. Didn't spiral on him. Mick Paul steals second base during the next at bat, but. Facing Derek Mitchell, uh, Woods gets the strikeout and then a ground out to second base to end that inning. He comes back out for a second inning of work, three up, three down, dominant, uh, real smooth, and ends up striking out Travinsky to end that inning as well. So all in all for him, an inning two-thirds, no hits, no runs, no walks, two strikeouts. For a guy who was effectively wild to come in the next week, not walk anybody, and be dominant and go through uh, hitters like Brown, Neal, and Travinsky in that three-up, three-down inning was just massively, massively impressive. And for what it's worth, the ground out to second base and ended his first stint in the ballgame was Zeb Ruddle coming off the bat where he had hit the home run. So he just he stifled a dominant offense from LSU on Sunday. When, when nobody else could get shut out baseball, Cade Woods did. And it stands out because like we were talking about with Sam Dutton, Woods is a veteran guy who led Alabama's bullpen in appearances last season and comes in and can be a right-handed option for you. The fastball had plenty of life on Sunday, low to mid-90s like normal. The breaking ball was filthy. That's what he struck Travinsky out on, was a slider down and away. It, was, it He looked awesome in that, and, and it, it was it was great to see because, and again, it stands out because nobody nobody else got, nobody else to shut up ball. Uh, so that's impressive. I had one takeaway from the pitching, the final week going in, uh, that I would I put under something I wanted to see, it was emergence of right-handed relieving options. Whether it be Cade Woods, whether potentially it be Sam Dutton, other than, you know, Gavin Gidry, who we all know that you trust. And you saw potentially two of them in the final scrimmage weekend. I think that's massive going forward. So that is something I wanted to see. That is something that we did see. Um Kate Anderson thought he threw well. He's the freshman from St. Paul. He's coming off the injury, obviously, last year. So it's, it's just going to take some time. He was dominant again in his first inning, three up, three down. And then it, it, it just got hairy on him, man. They, they really started hitting him around. But the thing that we've talked about with him, he throws strikes. No walks for Anderson. Yeah, he gave up six hits and four runs. That's not great. But he's in the zone. And I don't think you're going to ask him to really go out there and do weekends right now. He's going to be a midweek guy for you. We'll see what he can do in a, in a starting role potentially there. I think he's going to get one of the first cracks out at him or Javen Coleman. And, and we'll see kind of where that goes. The second inning has been a, a big problem for him so far in these in these scrimmages. And each one, he's given up a run. So, um, And twice, it's come off of a dominant shutdown first. So that that is something... That is something we want to see uh, for him going forward. But the stuff's plenty good enough. To fastball in the mid-90s, I mean, 94 uh, pretty consistently, and it, it's in the zone. And I thought his breaking ball looked really good early in the game, or the scrimmage, I should say, as well. It tailed off a little bit uh, towards the end. Javen Coleman, I thought Coleman pitched better than the line indicated. The problem for him, free passes. He had four free passes. And that is 
something I'm willing to give as a one-off because the previous two times I've seen him, he didn't really have any free passes at all. I mean, um, and he had been he hadn't given up a run. He gave up the three run homer to Bingham, but you you look at that that situation. He he could have been out of the inning um, because it, it comes on a you know on a, on a two with two outs. He strikes out the first batter. You have the diving catch in, in right field. Went through this, but then he hits uh, he hits a batter. It was Milam. So you're at the bottom of that order. You hit the in that order the eight hole guy with two outs. He advances the second on a dirt ball. You walk the nine hole hitter and flip the lineup over, and then you give up the three on homer. So there were opportunities to be out of that inning. The free passes just got to him there. But uh, again, that's the first time I've seen that from Coleman this this preseason period. I'm, I'm willing to brush that aside a little bit and still say he's been one of the most impressive guys that I've seen. Um, but this is what I want to talk about, and uh, and then we'll wrap up with a, a few miscellaneous notes. And it will send you off into your Monday. So one thing we have spoke about at length here is what LSU does at the back end of the game. Because you have two guys in Justin Lohr, the Xavier transfer, and Gavin Guidry, who you feel very confident in in closing a game out. And we got to see, and and the, something we've, there's, what order do they go in? Well, we got to see it a little bit in that game or scrimmage, whatever you want to call it, on Sunday, where both Justin Lohr and Gavin Guidry are quote-unquote on the visiting team for this game. And, again, I told you they played six innings. Um, Lohr came in in the fifth with... um. Uh, he started that inning. Okay. That was, sorry, the fourth. He came in in the fourth. Or was it the fifth? Did I did I note that wrong? I might have noted that wrong. I did note that wrong. I'm sorry. It was it was the fifth. Uh, the bottom half of that. And his team, the visiting team. Let me just reset this. That might have been hard to follow while I was trying to figure that out. Okay. They played six. Laura comes in. His team, the visit, quote unquote visiting team. They have a one run lead. Fifth inning. So they're wanting him to protect the lead. Well, he gave up a solo home run to the first batter. That's not great, but he he bounced back extremely well. Um, that was the home run to Milam, by the way. He would come back immediately, strike out Malazzo, get the wall. He, he would walk Bingham, who would steal second, and then he'd get the strikeout of, uh, of Josh Pearson. So he bounced back very well. The slider was... Absolutely filthy. Fastball, you know, about 89, 91, uh, mainly throughout throughout his time. But what you really wanted to see was him hold that lead. He he couldn't. Uh, at least in that situation. That's not going to happen every time. It's I'm not, you know, this isn't to say panic. It's just to point out which way they went with this. Now, you go to the bottom half of the, of the sixth inning, and the game is tied, and they went to Gavin Gidry to hold it at the tie. Gidry gets a strikeout to start. Uh, a pop fly to left field, and then it got hairy. Paxton Kling singled up the middle sharply on what I believe was a two-strike count, and he would steal second base. It was, he's just very, very fast. Uh, it was not even close uh, down uh, down at second. And, uh, and then Michael Braswell comes up also in a two-strike count and delivers a RBI single, which was the end. That was the walk-off that I kind of alluded to earlier, and after that, they, they ended the scrimmage. So, you got your first look at what it might look like at the end of the game, where they went lure Gidry, and although the result isn't what you want, you still feel very confident with that tandem back there, given the larger sample size of what Lure was able to do at Xavier with his seven saves and six wins, so 13 decisions on the winning side, and what you saw from Gavin Guidry last season at the back end of LSU's bullpen. I think that sample size is much larger than Sunday, but it just gave you a glimpse as to what order they might be looking at. That didn't work. Maybe you flip it around now and you go Gidry Lure. That's going to be something they have to figure out. I just wanted to note it because you got to see it in a game scenario there. Uh, and albeit it didn't, yeah, it didn't go particularly the way that you, you hope it will in the future. You you gotta look at it. Um 
and at least we kind of know now maybe what they're thinking is in that spot. So uh, it's just fine-tuning things, and, and you'll have plenty of opportunities in the pre-conference to do that uh, going forward. So not, again, we're not pressing the panic button. It's just something to keep an eye on. Um, all right, I said i close with some miscellaneous stuff. Something else I said off the top was you got to see the guys in a lot of different positions. Uh, to start the game, Jared Jones was at third base. Ethan Fry was at first. Pierce from his right in right, and Milam was at second. Milam made a great play at second base. It was, excuse me, it was uh, the RBI ground out from Travinsky. Milam was shaded a little bit more towards the center because they were uh, the diamond they were playing Travinsky to pull. Travinsky kind of hits it, uh, hard hit ball too more towards the right side. So Milam had to range from the center of the field more towards his normal position. He scooped it up all in automation motion and through the through the uh through Travinsky out. It was it was a great play uh to see him make there at second. We uh I did not no one hit a ball to Jared Jones at third. I was actually kind of mad about that. I wanted to see how he did over there. I thought Ethan Fry was fine at first base. He also didn't have to field a ball, but he caught everything over there. The footwork looked great caught everything it was great so again like jones he's a big target like he's a big target for guys to throw to you shouldn't have an issue hitting him in the chest and and they didn't uh so and we've talked an awful lot about fry trying to find a spot for him to get into the lineup potentially because the bat is or has the potential to be so lethal he also played some right field they also put milam at third base he did not get to field a ball there um Pearson obviously played second, and Jones went back to first uh, when they when they did the normal stuff. The other thing that I found interesting, Jake Brown got to play some center field. And uh, again, no one hit him a ball, but he got to play some center field, which I, I thought was, was interesting there. So those are kind of my miscellaneous notes uh, that I had written down. Just We've talked an awful lot. That's them preparing for any scenario that they might have throughout the course of the season keeping Pearson fresh in the outfield if they need to send him back there having Milam still play some infield uh and, and played again very well defensively which that was kind of the thing that knocked him out of the running he just he wasn't able to make the routine play in the fall and today the one play he made great was the one we just talked about and it wasn't routine so uh that's obviously encouraging as well so I'll say this coming out of the scrimmage weeks I feel good about LSU they are by no means a finished product they have to get a little bit more consistent on the mound uh, I think you've seen great stuff from certain guys pretty consistently like Nate Ackenhausen like Luke Holman uh, really like Thatcher Hurd up until the you know the, the outing he had Friday but you, you need a little bit more uh, Javen Coleman I thought had been really consistent until until Sunday and I really like I said I don't think he pitched that bad it's just a free passes you just still need a little bit more consistency out of certain guys. I think you want to see more consistency out of a guy like Cade Woods. Throw Sam Dutton into that now, too. Uh, a Christian Little. You want more consistency there on the mound because the depth you have is awesome. And you want to get that end-of-game scenario hammered out, which I have no doubt that that they will. So that's one thing there. Offensively, I actually think they're ahead of schedule. I do. And I know I, know I said on like the first show that I was going to try and temper my expectations at, as, as much as I could, but it's because I think so highly of this staff. I, I really do. Even with some of the struggles, I still think so highly of this pitching staff going into the year to see what the offense has been able to do, to see that pop remain in the lineup. That has been very encouraging to me and it, a lot to see – uh, you know, a freshman like Jake Brown take the mature at bats that he has. The C Paxton clings at bats look so much better already than they did last season, really at any point last season. Uh, Josh Pearson's been hot. Mac Bingham coming in and being what he is. I feel much better about this lineup going into the season than I thought that I would because in the fall, they got dominated by the staff and it did not happen that way in the spring. And the other thing is they they make adjustments. You, I can see that throughout. You, you could have got like Josh Pearson. He struck out his first at bat Sunday, came back the next one, and that's when he gets a, he immediately gets a hit. So, and it gets the same pitcher. Left on left with Cade Anderson. He makes the adjustment. You have enough veteran pieces that if you can stack this the correct way, you, you're going to be able to keep your head above water offensively. And then when it comes together, and like I said, I think they're ahead of schedule of it doing that. They're, they have the potential to be a really, really special offensive ball club this year. And they're going to need to be because I think the pitching will be fine, but LSU's going to face some dandies on the mound themselves. And they're going to need to be a, a really efficient offensive 
offensive ball club. So I feel very good about them. I think they're going to win a lot of baseball games. I think they're going to have a great chance to make a run back to Omaha and see what happens when you get there. Play your best ball for two weeks like you did last year and see if you can win national title number eight. That's where I'm at coming out. I I think balance. If I had to give one word to LSU's ball club after watching them through this preseason, now on game week, it's balanced. And that's all you can really hope for. Because, again, coming out of the fall, it wasn't. It was the pitching staff ruled. But they have evened that out and not a moment too soon because they they threw the first pitch on Friday against VMI. That's going to wrap us up here on today's Moose at the Box. Might have went a little long there. Sorry, told you I had a lot to get through. Wanted to empty it out. So uh, if you don't if you don't hear it all in one sitting, come back and listen to the rest of it later uh, and, and get your get your full take on the final weekend of uh, of scrimmage ball at the box get subscribed up to the youtube channel subscribe up to the podcast as well anywhere you get your podcast hit the bell when you subscribe up to youtube it's greatly appreciated we'll be back tomorrow here on muso at the box continuing the countdown finally here for game week lsu and vmi see you then